Hi, everyone. Today, I'm going to be talking about mental health. Obviously, we're talking about violence. Um, but the, the different twist today is we're talking about mental health, and it's such a huge, huge part of our health, obviously, and a huge part of um, men having difficulty getting help. So let's begin. Welcome to the presentation. So this is um, grounded in uh, the, this, the base presentation that Dr. Sue O'Donnell talked about this morning. Um, her um, qualitative analysis was about um, violence, of course, and masculinity and the paradox there. And I will be talking about mental health manifestations of cumulative lifetime violence. So I will not um, get into the details about the um, bigger study because you've already heard that from Sue. So we'll just kind of focus on the, um, mostly the findings for mental health. So this is the research team and you may have seen this <laughs> earlier. So we do have Dr. Sue O'Donnell, me, Charlene Vincent, Dr. Kelly Scott Story, Dr. Judith Weist and Jeannie Malcolm. Okay. So let's position ourselves into the experiences of men who have experienced cumulative lifetime violence. By listening to Kevin, not his real name, of course, a research participant, talks about mental health in relation to cumulative lifetime violence. Quote, I didn't want to be noticed. I wasn't able to communicate with people properly because I didn't want to expose myself and I was always living in fear. It would be like there was a lion after me or a bear after me. It was that bad. It just felt like a disaster was going to happen if I had to speak in front of a couple of people or a group of people. So this is mental health. Let's look at mental health um, and violence in the literature. What do we already know? So commonly men's mental health issues are attributed to individual factors. You're behaving this way, therefore it's your fault. You are drinking, you are taking drugs, you are ignoring me, um, you won't get out of bed. Very kind of individual focused and missing the broader social determinants of health. For mental health, there's a lot of literature that writes about women's depression and anxiety being higher than men's, but men die by suicide much more than women. Women seek help for suicidality um, more than men, and that kind of, kind of that hole there, but men die by suicide more. So what's missing? How come men perhaps aren't seeking help for suicidality? And there are also other gender expectations like big boys don't cry, which I'm sure you heard a lot about with Dr. O'Donnell's presentation. The scope and depth of mental health research among men with histories of violence is limited. We don't look at cumulative lifetime violence. I'm sure you heard that this morning, but we look at it as single events. That one time um, you got in a bar fight, that one time you were bullied, um, the, the, the incidence of that one relationship with intimate partner violence as a target or a perpetrator. But we know that violence occurs across the lifespan and violence is violence. Um, so, you know, what happens to you is in childhood can be considered violence if we're looking at bullying, um, a lot of the Instagram bullying even, all the way to um, elder abuse. So we need to look at also target and perpetrator because what we, we know a little bit in the literature that it can be some similar health outcomes if you were a target or a perpetrator. So, so everyone thinks about what's gonna to happen to you with your mental health if you're a victim, a target, but you can also have mental health difficulties as we're gonna see because of being a, a perpetrator. So it's not just mental health difficulties cause perpetration, we're talking outcomes. So we know that vi um, violence um, contributes to mental health um, problems. Like we have the diagnosis, we have the clinical terms called depression, post-traumatic stress disorder and, and anxiety. And that these mental health outcomes can then um, give a higher risk for sub um, subsequent violence as a victim or a perpetrator. Um, Dr. Ardano talked about the cumulative lifetime violence scale, and this is measuring um, various um, forms of violence, perpetration, target, timing, um, whether it's a family, community, um, child, adult, and 
this is a tool that the research team created before I joined it's absolutely brilliant. Um, and it really helps us get a different view of what's going on. So let's look at it closer. The purpose of this study was to examine the mental health manifestations of cumulative lifetime violence, sometimes referred to as CLV, in men living in Eastern Canada. Also to better understand and contextualize the key variables, including gender and its link with violence and mental health. So the research question, very simply, what are the mental health manifestations of cumulative life Time violence in Eastern Canadian men. In our um, the original big study with the over 600 men, um, it, it was a multiple uh, a multiple method research project. So it started with the online um, survey and uh, measured the the cumulative lifetime violence through that scale. And so I'm talking about one of the qualitative studies that we did. We have 32 men in this study purposely sampled based on different factors, um, um, including the severity of cumulative lifetime violence. We will not go through these in detail. There were 32 men, so you have the ages there. And I think it's probably worth saying again that 87.5% um, 80, had both experiences as perpetrator or target. So we don't just think of people as a victim or just a perpetrator, a lot of times it overlaps. Um, so it's probably important to say again, um, depression is in over half, post-traumatic stress disorder in over half, um, and not just symptoms, but really the ones that um, would, would look like you could have the diagnosis. So it has a high threshold, probably other symptoms of depression in other people and, all, and anxiety, nearly 30%. Demographics. Uh, what do I want to point out? Um, so, you know, over 84% had some form of post-secondary education. There's um, difficulty with employment and low income, but certainly, um, you know, it, it, we, it's, it's, it, it was a heterogeneous um, sample, not just people who you think, you know, are the lowest marginalized people. It's people, it's you and I, it's, we're all in this together. We analyzed interview transcripts with using an interpretive descriptive design with a little twist of grounded theory. Um, so our ontological approach is that there are multiple realities that we really value the perspective of the participants and that knowledge is socially constructed between me as the researcher and the participant. Because I'm also a person who has had experiences and you can't sometimes just put that aside. Um, it's, it's about understanding the complexities of the human condition. So what we did was we, we take the, um, the transcript and, and um, code it broadly for themes, then we do it by line by line, looking for patterns of behavior within a social context. So today you're going to be hearing a major problem of the mental health problem, but also what they did about it. So a lot of process stuff, a lot of ING words, and that's kind of the grounded theory twist. Okay, enough for the process. Let's get into the findings. Let's take a breath. Let's take a drink. Ah. So the effects of CLV on men's mental health is enacted through their relationships. That's it. The experience of cumulative lifetime violence is a severing of mutuality. With others, with people in the relationships, people in their um, their interactions, so it's experienced as detachment or disconnection with others. The mental health effect of detachment is perceptual interference. We'll talk about that more. Mental men manage perceptual interference by rectifying detachment, and these are kind of codes categories that um, are created into concepts um, in this published paper. So this, the rectifying detachment is a search to feel valued in the relationships. That's what it comes down to. So let's look at the, more of the details to figure out what this means. Detachment is a disconnection from others. And it is basically what's going on with cumulative lifetime violence. It's the feeling of being cut off or separated from one's relationships and the rest of the world. Men's new and reoccurring experiences of violence of target and a perpetrator in childhood and adulthood, repeatedly over time, sever connections. 
with people in the world, not just relationships, but interactions in the mall. And it severs that sense of mutuality that we have um, among each other. Like I'm deserving of water, you're deserving of water, we're all here together. Um, if I sneeze, someone says, bless you, that's kind of like that mutuality. So it's kind of severing that sense of mutuality with others, undermining their self-worth and giving rise to distrust and fear. Fear of harming others, like, uh oh, I might harm someone, and fear of being harmed. So detachment disrupts thought processes. And, and this, the coin, the term here is perceptual interference. Now, um, I spent a, a long, long time as a psych nurse, and in that world, we'd probably call it cognitive distortions. Very clinical and um, and, and so to be um, strength-based in, in this study and really look at, at it from the, the uh, participant's viewpoint, um, you know, this feeling of being interfered with, you know, like when I had postpartum depression, I was driving across the bridge with my infant son. I had the intrusive thought of, I should drive off this bridge. And I think that would be a good idea. I didn't want to feel that way. It made me feel very guilty. And when I heard that you can have intrusive thoughts, it made me feel so much not guilty anymore. So that's why it's important to really look at perceptual interference because nobody wants to say, I want to hurt someone. No one feels like that. Well, the men in the study didn't want to. So it is basically a distorted interpretation of the environment. Now, how is it distorted? Is that fair to say? Is that... You know, it's not distorted when it's happening to you. So who gets to say what reality is? I'm not going to get into that discussion. But, you know, they, they really started thinking like, geez, I'm in the mall and I'm scared. Like, what's going on? So it alters men's interpretation of what is going on in their relationships or their interactions with others. And it disrupts their thought processes and their capacity to interact with others. And it involves a disruption of their sense of self-worth their sense of well-being, and it ends up making them feel like they're, they're misinterpreting the intentions of others. They're misinterpreting, believing that um, interactions with others are unsafe. Perceptual interference is a barrier to getting close to others. So it exists within the social context of norms and gender roles, expectations to be a real man. You're supposed to be strong. You're supposed to be independent. Don't you dare rely on anyone else. This kind of feeling of having to be like at the stiff upper lip that I know um, Dr. O'Donnell talked a lot about. So it's kind of that whole thing. It, it's, it's intertwined of this feeling of difficulty connecting with others, but there already is that kind of bedrock of um, having difficulty opening up, especially about your mental health because people think you're crazy if you have these thoughts. That's just the narrative in society. All right, let's look at John, detachment leading to perceptual interference. Although John considered his willingness to face violence as a good thing, I only allow one phone call to come through. My son never ever talks to me, but when I'm presenting, he's gonna call me. He's at university. Probably can't find his underwear. Okay. Dear God, isn't that interesting? I swear to God, I haven't heard from him. Anyway, okay, so, but that's a good thing, right? Moms and dads, parents, they're supposed to be independent. Okay, I miss them. So, um, so John figured that being willing to perpetrate violence was a good thing. It means I'm tough. It means I'll stick up for people or whatever. But he did acknowledge, acknowledge that that willingness threatened his own safety, just the feeling. While he discussed difficulties socializing with others, he says, quote, I'm always looking over my shoulder to see if someone's going to stab me. That affects your mental health. In psychiatry, we don't consider this mental health. We just consider the labels in the DSM-5 as mental health. So we're, we're missing something. So importantly, perceptual interference is similar whether cumulative lifetime violence is experienced as target, perpetrator, or both, leaving, le leading to disconnect. You can just imagine someone, um, we've had a couple of people that who were in the army who had gone to Afghanistan, and that kind of um, 
heroic, um, important thing that they're doing for our country and the world um, can make you feel a uh, disconnect with others, with the, the job that they have to do, um, perpetrating violence essentially. And, and that might not be fair to say, it should be just protecting the world. Um, but so, you know, they talked about that, about how they come back from war, having um, interacted with human beings in a detached way because you have to be willing to end their lives. That's what war is. So they talked about coming back from that and feeling de detached from others. Okay, so just as a little review before we get into more of the details. So CLV, cumulative lifetime violence is a severed mutuality with others, uh, detachment. And um, it, what does it do? It disrupts our thought processes and perceptual interference and it leads to low self-worth and fear of others. Okay, so how do men respond to this? Well, they want to rectify the detachment. And rectify was chosen specifically, not, not just managing, but I want to fix it. Like, I need to get it done now. Um, it was this sense of urgency. So they do this in many different ways. Hmm. Good thing I looked. So rectifying detachment, it's men's efforts to fix their sense of being disconnected. They don't want to feel disconnected. Even though sometimes we think they do. There's, you know, one of the guys talked about being in the woods alone and he just wanted to not be with anyone, but he did. He was just needed to be in the woods alone to kind of figure things out. So it represents men's um, efforts to fix. It, it accounts for all the behaviors and efforts to feel valuable and respected, which can lead turn into closer relationships or more or more disconnect. Um, tensions between competing, competing demands to rely on others to feel connected and have a sense of self-worth, that's not manly, but to solve problems independently like a man. So that's that big tension, similar to the paradox. So how men do this, they do this in, in two different ways, kind of like a disengaging from people, but also when engaging with people. Um, so it's basically, um, I'm going to break it down. There's four different ways, two different ways they disengage, two different ways they engage. And it all has to do with the level of perceptual interference you're having. So for example, um, low perceptual interference would mean you have more support. So you do different behaviors, whereas the high perceptual interference would mean you're having much more cognitive distortions and difficulty. So the disengaging involves staying away from others. And the biggest goal is to avoid rejection. And the context, of course, the higher low perceptual interference, the engaging is about moving toward others. And the goal is to achieve connections. And, and you'll be interested in the different ways. Um, and the context, obviously, perceptual interference can be low or high. So now we're going to make it really complicated. We created a topology as a part of the analysis. So, Basically, the red is high detachment, high perceptual interference, the low is blue. So you can disengage with others with um, a high perceptual interference, you can disengage with low PI, you can engage with high and low. So let's start off with the first one. Get rid of the other three. And we're looking at disengaging with high, a lot of stress. So what's going on there? It is a process called closing myself off. So this is a disengaging behavior that involves a strategy to hide from others, to shut out the world by avoiding interactions or emotionally distancing oneself within a relationship, including going down to the basement so you don't have to face your kids and your wife because you're afraid of what you'll do. Um, so fearing rejection, uh, men hide their emotions as well um, and avoid close relationships in public places or social situations to reduce feelings of vulnerability and weakness. For most, closing myself off and void uh, included avoiding help seeking. And that's why maybe we're seeing some of that stats that men don't come for help for suicidality, just women, because they're dramatic and attention seeking. That's a whole other study. Um, sarcasm there. A lot of gender um, expectations that aren't so helpful. All right, let's look at an example of closing myself off. Carl described, quote, I turned into a vegetable and I wasn't able to do anything uh, except for lay in bed, unquote. Further emotional pain sometimes escalated to unbearable levels where they felt like they had to end their pain through suicide. 
Timothy described this, it would be just easier if I didn't have to deal with this, just get rid of myself. And from my experience um, in suicide research, um, people, of course, attempt suicide way more than they die by suicide, and they think about suicide way more than they attempt. So um, a lot of the times, a lot of the people we're working with, like have the passing thought, but we never need, need to talk about it because maybe they're not self-harming, but you can count on it's probably there somewhere. Um, so let's look at another one. Let's look at take the three away and look at this one is really interesting you want to pay attention here um, in the context of high levels of perceptual interference engaging behavior involves leveraging my stance to get the advantage to get the upper hand within a relationship or interaction men exerted their will onto others to gain a greater sense of control they need to feel connection and this is a pattern of behaviors that men describe as violence perpetration. You knew I was going to say that before I said it because you guys know this very well. So the goal is to elevate the position to one of power over others to establish self-worth. The strategy typically embodies high levels of anger, as men believe that others were to blame for the relationships and keeping with dominant uh, gender role expectations. The only permissible feeling is anger anyway. What are you going to do? Cry? <laughs> you know, that uh, brings a lot of shame. Um, and this was expressed on a continuum from frustration and irritability to rage. Desperate to connect with others while leveraging my stance, men place their need to feel self worth ahead of others' needs. So, having learned as a child to deal with negative feelings by being, quote, tough, Christopher, who felt shame for being violent toward his wife, leveraged his stance with more abuse to avoid feeling weak. I remember coming downstairs feeling so guilty and ashamed and uh, I just felt almost sick with my violent behavior. Um, but I pushed that all aside and mentally and physically abused her. It was a domination to bend to somebody, to bend somebody to my will. Christopher referred to using leverage to force a connection with his wife. Okay, let's look a little bit now about the low perceptual interference when a person maybe has a little bit more support, not so many cognitive distortions. And it's called disentangling. So this is kind of like um, unweaving of frig man, what's going on with my life? What, what do I want? So recognizing how their relationships, interactions, and other situations led to fear, isolation, and low self-worth, men disengaged from these circumstances and found new ways to connect with others. Disengagement in the context of low perceptual interference involves a greater understanding of CLV and detachment. Oh, this stuff happened to me. What's going on? How has it affected me? And this helped men to identify the factors that contributed to their disruptive thinking. Disentangling is a stepping back from things that disrupt their capacity to connect with others. Disentangling is possible when, they actual, when the acuity of CLV health effects are less intense. So they're able to take a breath and think. It's not like closing yourself off where you feel totally depressed and you can't get off the couch. This is kind of like a, a kind of waking up a little bit to figure out what's going on. And it permits men the space and energy to evaluate the impact of CLV on their lives taking a stock of factors contributing to their relationship fears and the reason they feel isolated helps men to contemplate it, what is needed to prevent further detachment. So it's just a kind of a loan process of thinking. <clears throat> Gaining insight helped men to loosen the grip of these social norms of feeling that men, you know, shouldn't have to rely on others or we can't be connected emotionally to men. So Edward elaborated on this. He said, dad wasn't very affectionate when I was younger. That shaped me in a way. A part of me still thinks that the man should be tough and quiet and it conflicts with the side of me that needs human contact. Kind of similar to the paradox Sue talked about this morning. His awareness of his father's lack of affection and how this influenced him as a child helped him disentangle and loosen the grip of the masculine ideal to be tough and recognize his need for human contact. He's human after all. The last one, low perceptual interference after disentangling is working through the past. 
Engagement um, here had to do with less severe disruptions in thinking and involved a lot more support, like being able to do this work, not on your own, but with someone else that you trust. Uh, learning about the negative consequences of violence, including detachment and making efforts to improve their relationships and feel better about themselves and moving toward people. Um, it helped men to let go of the belief that detachment was an indication of personal failure. <sighs> Maybe I'm not a complete loser. Maybe I'm not a complete failure forever, 100%. Um, so Kevin also explained this transition to seeking for professional help because professional help really helped me get there. Quote, it gets to a point where you're like, I don't really feel like doing this by myself anymore. When you relive, relieve yourself and understand that it's not weakness to rage out. So this increased self-worth motivated men to connect with others by being more assertive and asking for what they needed in assertive ways. Eric discovered that violence interrupted his ability to trust others and that he had been pleasing others at the expense of his own needs. Um, so he says, not having that sense of self until I really got into counseling and working through all those things and understanding it better and finding that identity, I was able and am able to keep my, the identity of my core self together. And a lot of that identity difficulty had to do with the expectations to be a man and what that meant to them. So what does this mean? What are we gonna do? Um, it's very embarrassing for me to know that um, 20 years in psychiatry, we never talked about violence at all. <laughs> we just looked at the symptoms. Um, so let's, let's look at a trauma and violence informed approach. So trauma and violence informed care, TVIC, is a service delivery framework that acknowledges a negative impact of past violence, past trauma, but this is where the V comes in, but also ongoing violence, because a lot of the time violence, you know, isn't just single events, but in the people that we help, it's, it's, it's throughout their lives. I've been in the corrections the last couple of years bringing nursing students there at Dorchester Penitentiary. It's a federal prison, the, the oldest one in the country, and um, they experience violence all the time, <laughs> every day. Like the guards have PTSD and, uh, so it's ongoing. Um, I, I'm on a psych unit there and it's, it's, it's uh, very humbling. So it's an approach to service provision that recognizes the frequency and far reaching impact of trauma and violence in people's lives and it tries to avoid re-traumatization. It's gonna be traumatizing. It's gonna be traumatizing if you go in for psych help. It, it oftentimes is. Not proud of it, I was a part of it. And, uh, and we need to think about trauma and ongoing violence a little bit better. This approach contrasts with the dominant model of healthcare services. So first, what we do is we focus on individuals. You're admitted, hi, you're my person, I'm gonna help you. Without thinking about you know, what's going on at home maybe, we had one woman coming in for ECT, electric and convulsive therapy. Does work, it's not too bad like the movies say. But uh, she was talking about her husband being a little controlling, kind of dropping hints. There was no way we were gonna talk to her about that. Just ECT and out you go. Um, so we need to look at the social determinants of health. Um, violence is one of them. Um, healthcare is often symptom focused. So you have depression. Okay, so we have some vegetative symptoms, trouble sleeping, trouble eating, um, trouble focusing, trouble with memory, do, 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 all these things that don't even include sadness necessarily. So we check those all off and we treat those things. Great, I want sleeping meds when I have insomnia, great. But we're missing the bigger picture. We just put all of our attention into those symptoms. Um, the dominant approach sees the problem and aims to fix the problem, but it's really helpful. Not only let's fix your depression, but what do you want out of life? Because you can live an okay life managing depression, but if you ask the question, what do you want? Sometimes it can help us get to the depression even better. And, you know, with the earlier quote with a um, couple of people being afraid to go out, that's called agoraphobia. Do we ever talk about violence and having that relate to it? Not at all. We think, okay, agoraphobia, let's do some cognitive behavior therapy. It's six sessions, give some medication, Ativan, blah, 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 blah. It's, we're missing the boat. Because since, you know, 87% of people in this qualitative study um, had both perpetration and, um, and target. So. 
those people are ending up in mental health care and we're missing the boat. So let's look at maybe what we need to do. Understanding perceptual interference may decrease our judgment that men are being um, difficult or resistant because they won't come for help. Well, can't help them if they don't come. That's, you see that a lot. Um, but you know, what are we doing to make, it un, to make it unwelcoming? They want help. Mental health services neglect the impact of past trauma, violence, and especially ongoing violence. I gotta say that again. Um, so corrections, you know, it's very punitive. Um, they may be missing the boat that, it's, that we, they need connections based on this kind of theoretical stuff. Maybe, you know, like peer help or just, just at least talking to your therapist uh, about that those need for connections um, because you have to look over your shoulder when you're in, when you're in prison. You know, you can't, it's really hard. <laughs> So finally, specific mental health services for men that address CLV are rare, especially in metropolitan areas. So we need to do better in rural health, which you all know. Another part of um, TVIC is the relational approach. This goes in contrast to what we've all learned in psychiatry to be very unbiased. You know, you sit there, the person's on the couch, you put your objective hat on, you don't tell them that you have a, ch a child. Um, to kind of really, you know, shake that up a bit, you know, this, this, this part about needing connections and the, um, the consequences of not of feeling detachment, it's pretty high, uh, high risk consequences that we're talking about here. So that kind of, it's okay to be a professional and demonstrate mutuality. Can we have coffee with our, with our patients on the psych unit? Probably, <laughs> it'd probably work. Um, can we talk to our clients about our, our personal life, you know, in a certain way that's safe? It goes a long way. We need to challenge our assumptions that it's us and them too, you know. Um, but also challenge gender expectations that we've talked about here. Um, but also, like I said, the peer, the peer stuff, there's research that shows that, you know, meeting where men already meet, like barber shops or, um, uh, workplaces, sports settings, but that's very, very gendered, isn't it? You know, men can go to the hairdresser and meet too. So we, we've got some binary stuff going on here. I realized that throughout this whole thing, using the word men and, and uh, it's the people in the study were men who said they identify as men. Okay, so let's look, let's look at as we wrap up here about the importance of understanding and that's why qualitative research is really helpful too to really understand what's going on can change who we are as professionals not just the knowledge but an ontological who are we and how do we take that to to wherever we're going to help because uh, men are finding it difficult to come through those doors um so uh, arthur explained how health professionals understanding help decreases perceptual interference. My family doctor is very aware of what's going on. She's concerned and she pays attention. She's a wonderful doctor. I started developing some sort of awareness and started progressing into some sort of recovery, you know, from all that abuse and tried to develop some sort of self-identity that was positive and meaningful. a fitting picture for the season except it's like the beach weather um, that's how I sometimes help my mental health with my little baby there um, but thank you for your attention um, this is a long presentation it's a lot of talking um, there is the the website with um, that shows our different studies in men's men's health and community lifetime violence but if you just want to um, email me too I can send you the link Thank you. I'm sure you're thinking about a lot, but at the end of the day, do you really want to talk more? <laughs> I want to hear from you. Hmm. You know, I don't remember seeing that theme, but that makes total sense, doesn't it? Because that whole productive thing, the provider thing. 
I, I think this, this um, uh, analysis kind of hooked on the relationship stuff and, and didn't look at the other stuff like substance use, for example. Um, so I think that fits really well. Yeah, the, the productive thing, the provider. Yeah, that would manage a lot of mental health stuff, kind of pushing it away. That makes that makes theoretical sense. Because many of our workplaces don't, don't play a big role, right? Right. Yeah. Hmm. Thanks for that reminder. Well, I'd like to hear from everyone else because I'm sure everyone here as well has good ideas. One thing that we saw is um, GPs, general practitioners, are really a gatekeeper to the system. So that seems to be a safe way because if you have a sore toe, you go to the GP. If you have a mental health problem, you also go to the GP. Like 50% of their practice is, you know, that mixed up. So, um, a couple of quotes that mentioned the GP exactly. Well, yeah. Like yeah. So, um, I think someone mentioned, you know, the education part, maybe in, in their curriculum, medical school um, could be a good place. Uh, I mean, I just everywhere, like, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I was thinking, yeah, I, it's certainly, it's, it's something that I'm sure can resonate across lots of sectors. I, uh, but I, I am curious if there's some that, you know, and again, for other people, if you're thinking, hey, it might be like a, a right for the opportunity yes. that typically this could be incorporated to be open some eyes in terms of understanding those behaviors and understanding the value of what the past behaviors and some yes. potential root causes. Yeah. That, just yeah. like substance use, just like yeah. suicide. Whenever I'm doing something to myself, I'm just um, the same with this. Yeah. Well, there is one person in the study who was a guard in a corrections facility. So I, you know, I guess that's so right for the picking because they have, they're, they're struggling in there and they're locked away, you know, that they're not prisoners, but they work there and, you know, just no one really cares. Mm -hmm. um, so I can see like helping with them because they continue to cycle with how they interact with the guards. If you're nice to the guards as a nurse, oh my God, you're just going to get bullied yourself. Wait, did you say if you're nice? Oh, you mean as a prisoner? Yeah, okay. if you're nice, no, if I'm nice as a nurse to the prisoners, oh. the guards are going to not be nice to me. Okay. Yeah, that's how that is. On that note as well, I can actually be there too, like up here as well, like like the nurse center team. And we were talking about toxic masculinity and vulnerability and how that contributes to the healing, especially in the recent story, so violent, um, and so hyper masculine as well. Um, and one of the things that we found kind of really awesome with the programming that we got in was um, we were doing this art space research method, the art space that you so awesome. And we were doing it with men because typically that method is done in women's prisons. Yeah. But with men, they love it. There's a hesitancy. Yeah, with yeah. this art space, yeah. it's not magical. They love it. And that was part of it as well. Like we did a creative writing so program. Nice. And we got them to write about masculinity. Oh my God! You should be up here. <laughs> That's crazy. No, no, but but, but this was a few years back, and there wasn't a lot of conversation around, especially those institutions. And so oh. I think it's also like including like trauma centers, but also gender centered programming in men's prisons can be so healing, especially when they're done in groups, because how they relate to one another, is yeah, how they practice their masculinity. Yeah, and so even creating these small spaces yeah. in those violent where they can kind of break down these barriers and engage in vulnerable conversations about their own feelings on their own terms, which is really great with our space, is because what we allow them to do is write. So it started out very like creative writing programs where they weren't okay. talking a lot about their identity, but yeah. as it progressed, we were seeing these spaces coming out that we could then apply to kind of trauma informed practices, especially for like some of their psychologists. Um, wow. And so that's a space that I think really needs it yeah. because you know we spend these money to these institutions to what to heal no to, to broadway to get worse yeah or to leave prison 
Yeah. More violent, more angry, like, yeah. like you were saying with Sarah. Like, yeah. So, so these sort of, um, there's a lot of opportunity and moments for traditional support in those facilities that are often forgotten about that really feel a strong invitation to our safety yeah. inside of those institutions. That's brilliant that you do it slowly. We did it over, yeah, that's so brilliant. It was like a seven month research yeah. process. And so I kind of sneak in there. Yeah, and we slowly, like, we would get them to, like, write a response. Oh, to the awesome. Or to, like, yeah. engage in a childhood memory. Oh. And, like, write about how they felt when they were a child. And yeah. Now, and yeah. slowly. The stuff's going to come up. You know, exactly. anyway. Especially yeah. when you're writing creatively. Yeah. You can separate yourself from the writing. Oh, you really don't is. have to self-identify. Amazing. You know, but it was, it was so much for sharing that. Oh. Well, I think just to add, you know, just the two messages that I was talking about earlier, like this research really is demonstrating or challenging, I guess, some of those needs of some, like as Priya is saying here, experiencing female lifetime violence really disrupts men's capacity to connect with others in ways that are harmful. Um, but yet men are talking about the fact that they want both they want Connect with others through relationships with them, and how they are to buy our um, around men's experiences, or you know, or that men don't necessarily want to use violence, but it's expected of them. Their friends that they see that our messages that I just heard really support this. Like, you know, it's complex, more complex than that, of course. It's more complex. Ah, yes! Yeah, there is some work that shows that attachment disruption was associated with dysfunctional relationships and the disconnection. That's part of one of yeah. the findings, right? So, uh, if you give us time, if you look at our experience, it's yeah. going to impact. Yes! The attachment, so, yeah. To me, I, I love for the common thread. Yeah. That's where your target I love that. Be, right. They're, they're going to be multiple needs of the person. Yeah. Rather than an intervention that's just of this. Yeah. It's going to miss right. the, the trans diagnostic yeah. kind of yeah. element. Yeah. And that's what I think is important or most effective for all of these folks. Love it. Thank you for bringing that up. You know what? Can I ask the question? Do you think that someday we'll get to a point where, oh, this is terrible. But like I, with my son, I had postpartum depression, so I had difficulty with attachment. He had negative consequences from that. Um, this is so weird to say, but would would like difficulties with attachment be a form of form of violence? Uh, in terms of the person who had the difficulty well, the attachment, or the person? Well, I guess violence has got a connotation of being bad. Yeah. If you strip away all of that and just the core, what is violence? You know, the core. I'm wondering if I would see if me as a mother can't I can't talk to my son. I don't know his name. His, his name is Judah Colin Joy. You know, is that a form? It, I know I'm it's more trauma. Yeah, I, yeah. I see it as an adverse childhood experience. You know, like I think it's okay. just it yes, because I think if we start to label it violence, then we start to blame. Yes, violence. exactly. And, and, and it's not I don't know. Right? No. Well, so yeah, it's not it's a trauma. trauma. It's a trauma. There's a lot of biological stuff going on in there. Well, then, is it the person's fault as an adult to kill someone? This is just philosophical question. There's questions. always many things I get attributed to the past, and it's never. Yeah. Been. And you have lots of people that have trauma attachment in the past that are that are of course. of course. So the, the development of pro, pro violence thinking, the development of emotional dysregulation and not finding that way to cope, right? So this is why I always get yeah, 
perturbed when I see someone go in the direction of where I'm supposed to take. Because mm -hmm. you have to see the totality of that person's path to understand yeah. how it all interacts yeah. and it led to this. Yeah. And then that lets you unpack it so you can design an intervention. I love design it. an intervention that actually will meet that person's yeah. needs um, in an individualized way, right? Um, right. And so you got to layer it. So yeah. How I see it, uh, and there are four elements that are often there for many people. Yeah. But what's most important is those elements that you care about. Hmm. Awesome. Thank you for giving me all that language. Making sense of all the ideas in my head. <laughs> you know, some psychiatrists um, would say, you know, that's all this Freudian stuff, looking at the past. You know, it's all about money. You know, that the cognitive behavior therapy, six session, boom, 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 get them out. You know, help the wait list, save money. It's just uh, there's a place for that. Yeah, not, not but just maybe Moncton. not for. Well, the people who get into the mental health clinic, at least in Moncton, aren't the people who are going to benefit from six sessions because they're only the high, high highs get in. And then there's a year waiting. But the system does work well. But I think you know, whether they are or isn't there, there's no relationships. People don't know how to have them. No. There's lots of reasons why they have learned this way to do it. I uh, work before to keep it safe, sense of safety is a big control, and then there's others that are still. Can I have that in writing? <laughs> The condition speaks. Like <laughs> but so it's just, you just need to keep an open mind yeah. and understand that there's many yeah. ways to get yeah. there. But there are some common threads yeah. that can target prevention or early intervention. Yeah. That can get us to the further journey and then you can solve the dilemma of the way it affects your family. Any more Well, we can always talk by email and keep the conversation going.